And the devil very simply has a plan. If he can do away with the Jews, he can stop his own demise. And you know what, friends? He's wrong. Number one, no one will ever exterminate all the Jews. It will not happen. Number two, you cannot derail. You cannot derail the plan of God, whether it be for salvation or whether it be judgment. It will happen. For those of us who know Jesus and have given our heart and life to him, it's a breath of fresh air and a promise that we can live with in hope. For those that don't know Jesus, it's a death sentence. You know what, I want to say one more thing before we plunge into this, and it's really not my plan to be long-winded, but I'm telling you, this is burning in me. There were men in Germany who refused to capitulate to the edicts of the Reich's church. One was a man named Dietrich Bonhoeffer. You can buy his biography. I encourage you to do so. A young man, well-educated, theologically sound, who came to the United States before the Nazis completely consolidated power. And God spoke to his heart and said, Dietrich, the church is being torn apart in Germany. They will not know the word of God if men don't stand. Dietrich Bonhoeffer found a way to get himself snuggled, smuggled back into Germany and started an underground, uh, underground seminary. The gospel began to spread again in Germany under the name of the Confessing Church. And what happened to Dietrich? Days before the liberation of the Allies, he was executed. But he died with a hope. So what is the malfunction with Christians that are not willing to simply risk somebody getting mad at them if they tell them the truth about their condition before God and ask if you might share the gospel with them. Nobody's going to kill you for it yet. Will people get mad at you? I'm going to tell you the truth. The closer you get to Jesus, the more some people are not going to like you. Make peace with it. I would much rather have a hundred people mad at me for confronting them with the words of Jesus than to miss the one who repents. And I know it's going on. The 20th chapter of Jeremiah opens with this scenario. It is now about two years until the complete and total destruction of Judah, where everybody's either killed or carried away. There have already been two invasions, and the people are so filled with this sense that they want to continue to worship other gods, that they blame Jeremiah for his message. The king the last king is in the ninth year of an 11 year rule, uh, rule. In just 60, in just six months from the time this is written, Nebuchadnezzar places a siege around the walled city of Jerusalem. And famine becomes so sincere and the people's hearts are so seared against God that they become cannibals and they begin eating their own children. They have been told right up through the siege by false prophets and false teachers, false priests, that Jeremiah is lying, that nothing is going to happen, even though there's been two invasions, that God is going to rescue 
but what God? Jeremiah is telling them they're in the position they're in because they have left Yahweh. They have left the God, the creator of the universe. But they are being told that the reason is because they've left the worship of their false gods. And they are being led to believe that if they will just return to the worship of Molech and the Baal, if they'll just go back to worshiping in the way that they had worshipped, murdering children, that everything will be all right. And where did they get that notion? Because times had gotten hard before, and the people turned away from the word of God under Manasseh, and things seemed to get better. The economy perked up. Everything seemed to be okay. There seemed to be a period of peace. And they're thinking, well, if we just sacrifice more babies, if we just keep doing what we were doing with false gods, Jeremiah's lying to us. Everything will be okay if we just do that. And so their hearts are hardened against God. Things have gotten tough for poor people. They can't find enough to eat and there's no place to get it because of the siege. The elite have gotten fat. As a matter of fact, people who used to work for wages on their farms now got no wage at all because the economy was deteriorating and there was no way to pay them. And so what they did is they worked for what food they could get out of the fields. Those who had money made money. And those who had no money became slaves. Not in word, not in so many expressions, but functionally, you worked for free, or you didn't eat. A direct violation of the word of Almighty God. During the first invasion, Daniel was taken, and now he's becoming the second ruler in Babylon. During the second invasion, Ezekiel was taken. And if you'll remember from our study of Ezekiel, Daniel was influencing the government in Babylon. Ezekiel was influencing the people, writing the letters back to Judah, telling them, surrender. When they attack, don't resist. If you don't resist, they won't kill you. They'll bring you back to Babylon, Babylon where I am and you can wait it out. Wait it out until God fulfills his promise to restore Israel. Don't fight the judgment of God. And the prophets in Judah continued to lie saying they had heard from God and nothing's going to happen. Everything will be all right. Their king telling them everything is going to be okay. It's all going to work out. The people wanted to hear them, wanted them to take from their government to hear everything was going to be okay. Friends, I'm telling you something about our own nation. The scripture tells us that we are ripening for an antichrist. In time of trouble, he will stand up. Daniel is clear. And he's going to tell everybody, friends, everything's going to be all right. Everything's going to be okay. I have a plan. And that plan, like Adolf Hitler, will be to give him ultimate power. And he will control everything like Big Brother. You don't think that we're on a slippery slope for that? Has anybody heard the term facial recognition? Have you heard that Wells Fargo is refusing to process credit card uh, purchases for firearms related things? Have you heard that Facebook has been, you realize if you're on Facebook, that you are not the customer, you are the product. They sell your information. 
You say, well, I'm not gonna let them have facial recognition information. Really, is your picture on Facebook? Well, I'll get off that, I'll be yours. Ezekiel's been writing letters back telling him, surrender, don't, don't, don't lose your life over this. This is God's judgment and you can't stop it. Jeremiah is in Judah, trying to save his country, preaching the repentance, calling out the unrepentant, lying, politically focused clergy who advocate idolatry and infant murder by fire to return them to their glory. Judah's leaders seek, uh, seek a deal with Egypt. This is the straw that breaks the camel's back, you see, because the king has got certain problems, the last king. Number one, the guy is wishy-washy as all get out. He can't make a decision. He's pulled to and fro by Jews who say, what you need to do is you need to go to Egypt, make an alliance, and allow them to add their military strength to ours. And if you'll do that, then we can turn on Nebuchadnezzar. But there's a problem. You see, after the first and second invasions, the last king is put in place by Nebuchadnezzar. He is a lackey of the Babylonian government. And he's being encouraged by people inside to foment a rebellion against Nebuchadnezzar. Jeremiah is telling him, you cannot stand against the judgment of God. You, there's not a way out. Friends, that's part of the gospel. When we all recognize that we were sinners and worthy of death and there was no way out and we came to Jesus and we repented, it's because we had come to a knowledge of the truth and we allowed him to die in our place. The king is faced with a truth that Jeremiah is speaking in one ear and who other Jews with another agenda are speaking in the other, wanting to shake their fist in the face of God for judgment. A gospel message that doesn't make clear that we are under a sentence of death is not the gospel at all. When they go to try to make a deal with Egypt, Nebuchadnezzar finds out sends an overwhelming force to Egypt and pummels their military. Now you would think that that was Nebuchadnezzar's action. You know what it really was? God had made a judgment for Judah and he would not allow anybody else, anybody else to interfere with what he was doing with his people. And I have a word for you. For some of you, I've said this before. You need to be really careful about trying to rescue everybody. Sharing the gospel, certainly, with anybody and everybody. But when God is dealing with somebody and they fall upon hard times, if you get between them and God as he's dealing with them, he will take you out to continue to get to them. Step aside be there to counsel, but you are not helping by bailing them out of their circumstance. They have to come to the same realization you did, that it's surrender to God, and you are not their God to bail them out time after time after time. Don't do it. Well, Turn with me, please, to Jeremiah 20. Now, Pasher, the son of Immer, the priest who was also the chief governor in the house of the Lord, heard that Jeremiah prophesied these things. The name Pasher is Hebrew for freedom. His name was Freedom. Then Pasher struck Jeremiah the prophet. 
and put him in the stocks that were in the high gate of Benjamin, over on the north side of the temple complex, which was by the house of the Lord. Now, you need to understand that this does not communicate what it says in the Hebrew. If I could do more of a thought-by-thought -thought translation as opposed to a word-for-word. -word. The guy whose name was Freedom savagely beat Jeremiah, beat him within an inch of his life. And then he took him to the gate and put him in the stocks. Now the stocks that you and I are, mo are most familiar with are things that we've seen on TV where yeah, they put the wrists in the stocks and they put their feet out and the punishment isn't pain. The punishment is humiliation before people. It's not what happened here. The stocks that were used in those days contorted the body for torture. And he left Jeremiah beaten to a pole in a position that tortured his body overnight. And it happened on the next day that Pasher brought Jeremiah out of the stocks. Then Jeremiah said to him, the Lord has not called your name Pasher, but Megor Misabim. Back to the Hebrew again. He said, the Lord hasn't called you freedom. You mean no freedom to Israel whatsoever. You bring bondage. And he says, you know what the Lord's changed your name to? terror on every side to everyone what you've been preaching what you've been teaching what you've done to deceive the people is going to bring terror to you because you're going to realize that your life is about to be snuffed out and the people are going to realize that you led them to destruction I think that's pretty good after being beaten to a pulp and tortured all night. He turns around and lets this guy have it. That is a man of God. Would have been much easier to just walk off. He goes on. For thus says the Lord, Behold, I will make you a terror to yourself. You're going to